I'm going to read you a, a very familiar passage of scripture because my, uh, my sermon this morning will be on a very familiar theme. It's found in 2 Peter chapter 3 and I'm going to read from verse 3 to verse 13. 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 3 to 13. Peter writes, First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. <laughs> he is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and, and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Six days from now, time will stop. I read those words on a website um, on December the 15th, 2015, just about two years ago. Six days from now, time will stop. Let me read all of it, or most of it for you. <clears throat> on December the 21st, 2012, not 2015, 25, 12, the world will come to its end. On that date, Jesus will come down from heaven surrounded by a bright light. There are several reliable sources that have all but proven that December the 21st will be the end of the world. Now, he didn't give any of those sources, those uh, reliable sources that said the world was going to end on December the 21st, 2012. Obviously, they weren't very reliable, were they? But six days to get ready for Jesus to come, not very much. Did you know that uh, one very well-known Christian group has made seven attempts in the last 100 years to set a date for the return of Jesus. Every one of them was wrong. I knew Mrs. Kunk very well. She worked as a language editor in an, in an office near to mine in the uh, 
in the city of Pune in India. And one day she surprised us all by handing in her resignation, saying that Jesus was coming back in the early 1990s, and she wanted time to get ready. She'd calculated this date by her own personal study of the jubilee years of ancient Israel that we find in, in the Old Testament, completely ignoring the fact that uh, the jubilee years of of, of Israel have nothing whatsoever to do with pro prophecy. They weren't prophetic at all, but she saw prophecy of the return of Jesus in, in that study of hers. As a long-time employee of the church, uh, she was entitled to a, uh, a pension. But instead of taking that pension, she asked uh, uh, if she could take a lump, a lump some settlement and and she wanted to use the money to to print uh, uh, literature warning the world of its coming doom we pleaded with her we studied the bible with her but all to no avail she uh, took her teenage son out of school because jesus was coming and he didn't need an education and took him with her to live in isolation by the side of a lake way up in the barren mountains of the state of Maharashtra. And there she waited in vain for Jesus to come. With nothing to do, her son turned to drugs and ran away from home, his life absolutely destroyed. Now, I don't know where she is now, Mrs. Kunk, or even if she's still alive. I really don't know. If she is still alive, I have to wonder how she could possibly go on living without uh, any source of income whatsoever. 2,000 years ago, Jesus promised, I will return. And then he encouraged his listeners not to speculate not to set dates because he says no man knows the day or the hour of his coming. The only thing Jesus ever said to his disciples or to uh, his uh, listeners, the only thing he ever said with regard to time was that the Son of Man, and I read his words, the Son of Man will come at a time when you do not expect him. Now that's very clear, isn't it? So I wonder why, in the 2,000 years since Jesus said that, I wonder why more than 700 Believe it or not, 700 dates have been predicted for his return and the end of the world. 700. And yet Jesus, Jesus said, uh, um, the Son of Man will come at a time when you do not expect him. No man knows the day or the hour. 700. As we read God's word, we find there, of course, a sense of purpose, a sense of, 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 of destiny. History is going somewhere. Someday it will reach its destination. Time is moving forwards towards a climax. A climax when the heavens will open and the king of kings will ride forth. And on earth... That very day, time will stop and men will welcome their Savior. Now, we know that, don't we? So clear in Scripture, so plain. That's our great Christian hope, the great desire of Christians all through the ages. And so I want to think about that again this morning. I don't think these days we hear enough about the return of Jesus. We seem to have forgotten them. Not like the old days, Sister Grace. Not at all. So, uh, will, you, will you turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter, the passage that we read for our scripture reading, chapter 3, and we will start at verse 3. 
You must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. You see, today, as in the days of Noah, you and I live in a disbelieving and a scoffing world. We're told that Jesus promised to come back. He hasn't. Therefore, he won't. If it was going to happen, it would have happened long ago. And so we can now throw the belief away. Scientists want us to, uh, to believe that this world is relentlessly subject to the laws of physics and chemistry and that we live, therefore, in a stable universe. Worldwide convulsive upheavals just don't happen anymore, never have happened, according to the scientists. Now, we have disasters, of course, where they happen, but they are local and they are contained. We have floods and earthquakes. We have ferocious storms. There are wars and there's a lot of bloodshed. But nonetheless, they tell us, basically, we live in a permanent and unchanging world. Look around you. You live here in Scotland. Day after day, the same sun rises, waves break on the shore, and rivers run to the sea. We look up at the same unchanging mountains and the overriding impression that we can get or people get is that we live in a world of permanence. And sadly, uh, most Christians, and I, I, I say most um, Knowing what I'm saying, most Christians do not believe in the literal return of Jesus either. It's one of those way out beliefs uh, the Christian world now finds embarrassing and therefore unacceptable. We're meant to believe instead that Jesus' promise to return is fulfilled every time the Spirit enters into human experience. Every time a person gives his life to Jesus. Um, uh, that's when uh, he calls on sin, uh, from, uh, salvation from sin. Uh, Jesus has come back again. Every time we meet the needs of the poor and feed the hungry and clothe the naked, Jesus, we are told, has come back again. We need look for nothing else, we are told. One well-known and, and highly respected British theologian has recently written, when Jesus spoke of the end of the world in Matthew 24, he was not meaning the end of our world, but the end of the Jewish world that took place in AD 70 when uh, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was destroyed, and the Jews were scattered all over the earth. But not so, says Peter, very clearly in this passage. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Heavens will disappear with a roar and the elements will be destroyed by fire. Earth and everything in it will disappear. Paul says this is not a fable, it's not a joke. Convulsive upheavals do happen. They've happened before. God has destroyed this world once already by water and what he has done once he can and he will do again the second time by fire. Very clear in scripture, isn't it? You notice that, um, that Peter appeals to the flood to support his argument. Now I want to suggest to you this morning that a more powerful appeal is found at the cross. Because if Jesus did not return, then all he did there on Calvary would have been wasted effort. The purpose of Calgary, Calvary was to provide, to provide a way for God to deal 
with the sin problem forever. To forgive the sinner here and now and to bring him back into a, a, re, a close relationship with himself. A, le, a relationship that would endure and will endure uh, throughout eternity in a world that's made new and free from sin. That was the purpose of Jesus coming the first time. And, and, and the cross is God's promise and our assurance that Jesus will return. Paul explains it this way. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. That was the purpose of his first coming. He will appear a second time not to bear sin, as he did the first time, because he did that once and for all time, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him, to take them back home with him. You say, waiting for what? Waiting for the resurrection morning. Waiting to put on immortality. Waiting for life eternal. He makes a good point in his letter to the Corinthians when he writes, If our hope in Christ is good only for this life, we are of all men most miserable. And isn't that a fact? So the cross, the death of Jesus, makes our future certain, guarantees his return. Because he died, we will live. And because he came to an earthly end at Calvary, we will be given a new beginning when he returns. You see, at the cross, Jesus brought this world back from the grasp of Satan. Now, I know you believe that. Then, uh, then can you explain to me why has he not come back to claim this world that he bought back from Satan? Well, when I go out to buy a new car, for example, I expect to get right in and drive it away from the showroom. It's mine. I've paid for it. I have the proof in my hand. So why has Jesus not come back yet to claim his purchase? It's a fact that with every passing of a loved one and every report of evil, our response is always to ask when it will all end. Don't you say that to yourself? You look at the, 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 this last month of newspaper reports. Uh, hurricanes, cyclones, uh, killing in the Middle East, killing in Africa, Murder, all of the things that you read daily on the newspaper. And when I read those, I say, when is it going to end? How long is it going to be before Jesus comes in and takes control? We say with uh, the people of Jeremiah's day, the harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. Still not saved. How long, O oh Lord? I suspect that uh, through the centuries, many of those 700 who set dates for his return did so out of frustrated longings and despairing hope. To keep their faith alive, Jesus is coming in 10 days, keeps life uh, alive, hope alive. But you know, it doesn't work that way when you think about it. Because every passing of a suggested date weakens the faith of those who had put their trust in that date. It doesn't help to inspire hope and patience. It destroys both. So how long, O oh Lord? Well, Peter doesn't answer that question. Peter doesn't know. But he reminds us that God is not slow in keeping his promise. It's just that 
Time doesn't mean the same to him as it does to us. A thousand years for us is like a day for him. We live within time, and our lifetime is a mere 80 years. I had my 80th birthday last Thursday. Didn't mean to tell you that. <laughs> uh, but, but that's what scripture says. Um, God lives out of time, outside of time. Uh, and his lifetime spans eternity. No beginning, no ending, if you can understand that. And with him, there is no such thing as being slow or being late. He, he knows the time of his return, and he will come um, when the time is ready. That's what Jesus said. No man knows the day or hour, not the angels, not the son, but only the father. It's a, it's a good thought to have in your mind. 2,000 years ago, the date was already marked on God's ca in God's calendar for the time when Jesus would come back. 2,000 years ago. He knows. He's not delaying. He's waiting for his time to come. Listen to Peter again. And this is why he wrote these, this is why he wrote these words. The important thing is not when Jesus will return, but will I be ready? Since everything, Peter says, will be destroyed, what sort of people ought you to be? That's in verse 11. And that's a good question. What sort of people should we be? What sort of person should I be in view of the fact that Jesus is going to return? Peter gives us the answer. We are to live holy and godly lives and make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. You can read those words, verses 11 to, uh, to 14. Those are the sort of people, that's what the sort of person we should be. Um, live holy, godly lives, and making every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Let's look at the first part first. What did he mean by it? Uh, we are to live holy and godly lives. What does that mean? We discussed some of these in the Sabbath school class, didn't we? And we feel that we, we're not living godly lives, we're failing. Not living up to the standards. Uh, but if we're to be ready when Jesus comes, uh, Peter says we are to live holy and godly lives. What does that, what does that mean? If you turn back to his first letter, Peter's first letter, and chapter 4, and read verses 7 to 11, um, we read something that is um, uh, interesting, but also very challenging. How did Peter understand uh, what it means to live holy and godly lives? Now, notice how he begins in, in verse 7. The end of all things is near. So he's thinking about getting ready for Jesus' return. The end of all things is near. Therefore, he says, be clear-minded and self-controlled. Above all, love each other deeply. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I like that. Offer hospitality without grumbling about it. Um... Each one should use whatever gift he has to serve others. You see, those who will be ready when Jesus comes will be serving one another with love. Now, that's a different thought, isn't it? You'll be serving one another with love, offering hospitality happily and without grumbling. They will be using their special spirit-given gifts for, for, for service to others. Now, where did Peter get that idea? Um, we don't usually hear that preached when the pastor says we are to be ready 
for, for the return of Jesus. Where did he get that idea? Well, he got it from Jesus as he listened to Jesus tell the story of the parable of sheep and goats. What is it Jesus will say when he comes to judgment? Listen, come, take your inheritance. Jesus says this when he comes, when he returns. Come, take your inheritance. It has been ready for you since the world's foundation. And here's why. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. Homeless, you gave me a room, shivering, and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you nursed me. I was in prison and you visited me. That is how Peter understands about living what living a holy and godlike life is like. And it's an important part of what it means to be ready. It's important to belong to, the, to a church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, in this case. It's important about how we keep the Sabbath, what, we, what food we eat. It's important what side of a theological argument we stand on. These things are important. But as far as Peter is concerned, what is more important is that we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, room to the homeless and clothes to those who are sleeping on the street at night. Another part of being ready is to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Now you note the two words, uh, spotless and blameless. Now if you go back to, to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, Peter there describes Jesus as a lamb without blemish, or defect. And those are the same two words that he uses in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 that are translated spotless and blameless. They're just translated differently, that's all. Same two words in, in uh, the original Greek. When, and when you compare those two passages, it's clear that to be ready means we are to be like Jesus. Now you say, how on earth are we to be like Jesus? Hey, we spent 30 minutes in the Sabbath school class this morning trying to discover what that means. But this is what, uh, this is what Peter says. Uh, you want to be ready when Jesus comes, you are to be like Jesus. Um, when Peter listened to Jesus parable of the wedding feast, he took note of two things. Two things that were needed by each guest to the wedding. An invitation and a wedding garment. Those two things were very essential. To be like Jesus, to be ready when he comes. And both of them in Jesus' parable were supplied free of charge by the king himself. When Jesus returns, he will invite his people to the great wedding feast of the Lamb. To be admitted, we will need an invitation, and that has already been given to us. Because Jesus said, come unto me. That's the invitation. That's the rope that was let down in the well to pull us out. We will also need a wedding garment. And that also has already been prepared. And it is ours for the asking. In writing of that garment, Ellen White has said, the garment is the righteousness of Christ, his own unblemished character that through faith is imparted to all who receive him as their personal saviour. Yes, we are to live lives of devotion and obedience and witness to the one who died for us. It is important that we understand the prophecies and you're going to be studying those this afternoon, I understand. It's important that we understand the prophecies concerning his coming. It's important to be able to read the signs of the times we live in. 
It's important for us to know that Jesus is at the door. But the eternal reward will not be bestowed on us because of our good life, even our perfect life. It will be bestowed on us because of his perfect life and not mine. Not because of what we have done for him, but because of what he has done for us. It is his righteousness that counts. And we are daily to wear it. Being ready, I suggest, boils down to just one thing, and that is knowing Jesus. Understanding what he has done for us and accepting that gift that he gives to us. Trusting his sacrifice on Calvary. Living with him in our hearts and minds every day. You know, I have lived all my life with the conviction that Jesus is coming soon. I learned that at my mother's knee. I still believe it. It has been the hope and the assurance and the inspiration with which I have conducted my ministry. I was a youth once. And now I am a senior youth. <coughs> Will I still be alive when Jesus returns? <clears throat> I often ask myself that question. Will I be alive when Jesus returns? Frankly, I do not know, and the older I get, the less likely it seems. <coughs> William Barclay, um, the popular Scottish theologian, because he's dead now, he did not believe in a literal return. He saw the doctrine, and, and to use his words, he saw the doctrine as being full of difficulty. But, he wrote, <clears throat> this is sure. There comes a day when God breaks into every life. For there comes a day when we must die. And for that day, we must be prepared. You see, whether I die before Jesus comes or live to see him come, I have to be ready, don't I? And don't you? I lived in the city of New Delhi in India for five, six years. And one of the spectacular tourist attractions of India is the Red Ford in Delhi, the old city of Delhi. My wife and I used to go down there in the cool of the evening sometimes the light of the moon reflecting off the marbled domes and columns of the great reception hall where the emperors met their subjects in judgment. Jamuna River gliding lazily below the, the walls. We would go, we would take visitors there to see the light and sound show. And that, uh, that show told the stories of the great Muslim uh, rulers who built the fort, the Red Fort, and who lived in it. Uh, Aurangzeb and Shah Jahan, who, who built the, uh, the Taj Mahal in Agra. The last of the Mughal rulers was Mohammed Bahadur Shah. He was lazy, he was weak, he loved his pleasure and had little interest in government. And that ultimately is why the Mughal rule came to an end. And one day he, he called a, a, a feast and he invited his court officials and his, the generals of his army. 
And as was the custom in those days, the feast went on day after day after day and extended at times into weeks. Day after day, the wine flowed. And the girls, the dancing girls, entertained. Several days into the feast, a, uh, a horseman rode furiously into the, into the fort, made his way to the table where Muhammad Shah was sitting. <clears throat> with the news that the Persian army was marching against the kingdom. In fact, he says it has already crossed the Indus army, the Indus river. <clears throat> and through his drunken haze, Muhammad Shah mumbled, oh, it's a long way to Delhi. Dismissed the messenger, clapped his hands for more music and more girls and more wine. The next day, another messenger galloped into the fort. <clears throat> the enemy is in Peshawar. The army had descended the Khyber Pass and was now on Indian soil. It's a long way to Delhi. We've got time. Then the news was brought that the army was in Lahore. And it wasn't until the enemy was just a hundred miles away from Delhi when Muhammad Shah stirred himself into some sort of action. But by then it was too late. The end came suddenly and irrevocably with the laughter of the previous night echoing around his addled brain. Dancing girls were raped and killed. Wine barrels were emptied into the city gutters. And his generals were put in chains and dragged back to Iran, along with the fabled peacock throne. And 350 years of Mughal reign came to an inglorious end. Long way to Delhi. A long way. There's plenty of time. All the time we need. I want to suggest that it will be like that on the day when this world comes to an end. Too late for most people. It is time to get ready. Calvary calls to each one of us. The invitations have been given. The wedding robe is waiting. And the question is, will you accept it? My hope is fixed on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found clad in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. On, on Christ, the solid rock, do you stand? I invite you to make that commitment this morning and every new morning to ensure that you will stand ready when Jesus comes again. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your ever- present reminder in your word that one day our Savior will return for us to take us home, the home that he has prepared there for us, to dwell with him throughout eternity.
our hope, our inspiration. We thank you that you have prepared the way. You have given us the invitation and you have provided the garment for us to wear. The perfect garments of Christ's righteousness given to us. Grant us the faith that we need to accept your gracious work on our behalf so that we will have the joy one day being together in heaven, being together around your throne, singing your praises, having fellowship with Jesus, our Lord and Savior. May that be our experience in days to come because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.